Hello, this is Peter Combs from Bitamount.com and PL Combs Asian Antiques located here in Gloucester, Massachusetts. In this video, we're going to do a, a section on Chinese blue and white porcelain of the Ming Dynasty. Uh, the Ming Dynasty was the turning point for the application of cobalt blue in Chinese porcelain. It had been originally introduced in the slightly short before this period, during the Yan period. It had been in, uh, exported out of the Middle East into the, into the Far East by uh, Muslim traders. That's how it got its start. And while it's not possible in one video in 20 minutes to give you everything you need to know about it, I'm hoping here you'll get an idea of the range of colors that were able to be achieved uh, using cobalt blue by uh, Chinese potters. And especially uh, as the period, uh, the Ming Dynasty proceeded, they discovered their own sources for cobalt within China and mixed them with the imported cobalt. You can see here some of the sort of dramatic things they could do. On the right, you have a, a vase with a dragon that's reversed in white against a bluish background, and on the left, a dragon on blue against a white background. Pretty, pretty inventive for the time. And here's the bottom of it. It's always important to look at the bases of these jars, okay, to, to get an idea of what they should look like, because the, the fakes and copies today just don't match up, not nearly as good. And you'll also see that in in in, in early, mid, and Ming Ming, Ming pieces, you're going to find a lot of. Uh, uh, repeat patterns such as lappets like this. This one has a very elaborate lappet upper and lower border with that elegantly done lotus lid with a shaped rim fitting into it and a stem handle. And the bowls. They did a lot of bowls and the shapes of the bowls were uh, quite uh, stylistically identifiable here with this averted rim, nice high foot, well done wall, and this cuspidor with the wave pattern around the main part of the body and the acanthus leaf neck running up to a very wide, elegant, flared rim. Um, they did a lot of work uh, uh, working on uh, fixing shapes and getting shapes just right. And here's the bottom of this. They had a sort of an elaborate stepped bottom to it when they turned these and then they glazed them very carefully. Notice the bluish tone to the glaze. And here's a Jean D period uh, uh, bowl with a Greek border, Greek key sort of running around it, and again with those la lotus lappets running around the bottom. And a nice mark on the base. During the Ming Dynasty they also did stem cups in a wide variety. Some are underglazed blue, others are underglazed red, others are anois decorated, which is incised uh, porcelain on a white body against, uh, uh, against, the, against the piece and then glazed. Here's the mark. The mark on these are often placed on the interiors. You also find with Ming pieces, they place the marks on odd spots or on the edges of rims and so forth. So you sometimes have to scour the piece to find it if it has a mark. They do, they do fake them though, so be careful. Here's a hundred boys uh, bowl from the Jean D period. Nice deep blue. And here is a uh, bowl with vines and flowers. Again, the, the paste on this is very nice. Nice white paste, beautifully shaped foot, and elegantly decorated, outlined in dark blue and then washed in. You always want to look at how they outline their, uh, their drawing and how they gently wash in to give a very nice three-dimensional, very fluid effect to their painting, um, such as in this bowl. This is a mallow bowl. They're highly collectible and very rare. Uh, these sell for tens of millions of dollars if you're lucky enough to be able to come across one. You probably won't, but they're wonderful to look at and examine if you visit museums and so forth. And here's another Chenhua bowl. Uh, very nicely done, sort of sketched in uh, decoration uh, with a nicely, neatly done mark on the base. Very good. And now we're going to take a look at a Zhendi period uh, lotus bowl. There's not a lot of cobalt on this, but I wanted to show it uh, because it's interesting that it has a four character mark explained to a customer of ours that we sold a few years ago, but beautifully shaped and wonderful white porcelain. And here's another one of these Chenhua, uh, again, mallow bowls. Uh, this is a very famous pattern, uh, again, extremely rare, but notice how well it's painted. The decoration <coughs> and artistry on those are excellent. And like all Ming pieces, um, it was, it was, you'll also find uh, later Ming pieces that have earlier marks on them. This is a long-standing tradition, as you know, in China. You see Kangxi marks on early 19th century pieces. 
And here are just a few examples of Jondi marks that appeared on late 16th century bowls. They're the or pieces. The mark is, you know, 100 or so years out of date, but they continued to use it uh, because of the uh, uh, esteem to which these uh, pieces were held. And uh, these potters uh, just kept applying um, Jondi marks because they could sell them, frankly. And people would buy them as period, even back then, in many, many cases. Here's a dish. Uh, again, you can see, if you've seen enough of these, you recognize that the decoration is a bit uh, odd for to be Jondi. It should tell you that it's, it's not of the period. And here you have this sort of uh, uh, deep purple blue on this bird feeder uh, that, that wasn't done too much in that, with this tone. This purple color wasn't that big during the uh, Jondi period. <coughs> but came into common use later, especially during this period, the Jai Jing period. Jai Jing was a wonderful time because, a uh, wonderful period because it was a very long reign, 40 years, which is long for, the, for China. And uh, you ended up with uh, the potters at that time experimenting widely, and their things are very stylistically identifiable, uh, as you can see with this. The, the, the spacing and the style of the painting is instantly uh, distinct, and also the depth of the blue, it's almost purple. And that deep purple blue became quite popular during the Jiajing period. They also did a lot of experimenting with other color ranges in the Jiajing period, more than at other times previously. Um, and here you see the dark blue outlines, light blue, and even lighter blue. And you had bowls like this. This was a bowl that we had a while ago. Uh, that very stylized Buddha symbol interior in the body, and, and inside the bowl rather and then lightly decorated around the outside. Uh, they also produced these. This is a very nice sort of alms bowl. Deep cobalt blue. Again, that purple blue underneath the glaze. <coughs> Beautifully done. And again, here's, here's a purplish colored bowl with light blue. You'll see light blue washes there on the bottom picture. But very dark blue around the uh, majority of it. Again, almost purple. And then you have this heading towards almost a violet color blue, okay? This, they were mixing colors back then. They were trying every shade imaginable to get a pleasing effect. Because the, the potters didn't know what the blue would look like half the time until it came out. They were really playing it by ear. And they produced some wonderful shapes. Here is a very attenuated, tall, sleek um, uh, uh, Meiping vase with a stylized lap at bottom. And you had th these. This is, again, notice the scale and drawing of this. It's very elegantly done. The spacing on it's wonderful. The peacocks, lappet upper and lower borders. Nicely done. And they produced plates with blank cavettos. Sometimes they're decorated. This one has a blank cavetto inside the rim there. And the outer rim is just uh, plants and flowers and grasses framing it. And again, Another one of these. I want to show, I'm just showing you a whole range of these to give you some idea of how broad the color spectrum uh, became that was possible using cobalt and in, in the hands of a good artist. So you go from that dark purple color from that previous example, luxurious use of blue, to this very light piece. This is a more of maybe a provincial piece with two Fu lions and the Buddhist wheel on the interior. Here's a good detail of the phoenix. Stylized phoenix. Notice the angulation of the wings in that, uh, vi just a vine for a neck, really, and sort of a large head with uh, flowing feathers coming off of it. And then you had an even more simplified type. This has a little bit of a barbed rim to it, um, with, a, with, a, with a chimera or a dragon in the center chasing around uh, the interior and a vine border. During the Jai Jing period, they also made a lot of boxes. Uh, porcelain, eight-sided, and six-sided boxes were very popular. And you'll often see on the lids this, this type of decoration, a rocky outcropping with a, maybe perhaps a fruit or persimmon tree or something, and then a bird on it, sometimes people. Here is a, another one, uh, again, uh, with this one with little invected corners and edges. Um, nicely done. Uh, little firing flaws on it. You'll see, you do see firing flaws on the glazes of these from time to time. It's not all that unusual. And here is a style of dragon that uh, is very, very uh, typical of the Ming Dynasty. These long, stretched out, sort of prancing dragons. And 
you see it's, it's almost like a 180 you go to this now you have a light blue frame outlined in dark blue washed in of carp they did lots of jars and things with carps carps and birds um, and people here you have some flying uh, some flying storks around clouds and this little double gourd vase this is a pretty small vase about five inches tall and again you have another one of these boxes on the right is the mark on the bottom of the box and again you have the uh, the lid with this four with the four-sided lid with these uh, cartouches of uh, of uh, fungi and figures on the top and then you have this this is a very large basin they made some very big basins fish tanks in the Ming dynasty with dragons this one's in the water going around with the lotus lotus blossoms um, they're quite rare hope you can find one out there and here's a sort of simple um, uh, trigram decorated uh, jar probably a Buddhist thing with birds on it and a cash symbol border at the bottom and you have this this is a, a late Jai Jing uh, bowl with a ship on it uh, with banners flying and uh, sailors aboard uh, it's probably symbolizing some sort of trade and here you have a nice, notice the, the, the pattern in the center, that sort of calligraphy sweep that's underneath the pine tree. You're going to see these on jars and bowls, typical of the Jai Jing period. It's one of the, one of, sort of a design that evolved in that time. And here you have the outside of a bowl uh, with this sort of uh, almost cartoonishly drawn uh, phoenix with a very long tail. I think those are great. I like it when they do things like that. And here's a square-bottomed, uh, uh, gourd-topped uh, jar with uh, figures at the bottom and dragons at the top, rue head borders, all very typical of the period. Now here is that pattern I was just mentioning that we looked at with the um, with the bowl. You notice it again; it's almost like calligraphy coming up out of that rock at the bottom. Often they are emitting these from rocks, like vines growing out of them. Here's a detail. Uh, again, notice the outlining and the washing in of the colors and the sort of, this is a very loosely drawn piece. It's very appealing visually. It has a hairline in it, but that's not unusual in these. And here's a rather provincial large jar with loop handles on it uh, with sort of just really w the tone, the tonal range on this is pretty narrow. These are not terribly expensive. You could find them. This is a more desirable box. It has some flaws though. You notice the glaze gaps. Um, around the around the around the uh, walls there, okay. That's when the glaze pulled back. It was slab constructed, and it, it happened that way. And here you have a, a very nicely done violet blue, very elegant, uh, with these uh, uh, cartouches in the bottom, each bearing a dragon um, below a, a gourd with birds flying. And again, here you have that stylized sort of calligraphic uh, vine coming up out of the rocks. And this, this one, they, they, they tipped the ends with um, uh, bamboo leaves. Slab constructed cups made during the Jai Jing period where they were produced uh, fairly widely. They're very collectible today because not a lot of them survive. This one of the musicians is rather nice. And again, you have, again, this one is another of those sort of elongated dragons. They had elongated phoenixes. This one's a dragon. Notice how he's sort of prancing proudly around the outside of the jar. Nicely stylized upper border. And here you have a brown washed uh, dish. Sort of late Jai Jing. Particularly elegant, particularly pretty. Uh, nicely done inner border uh, around the rim. And again, you have one of these... Uh, these, uh, you have one of these uh, fish fish bowls uh, with carp and uh, uh, aquatic plants, lotuses, and so forth. And a, on the interior, there's a dragon swimming in all, all of it. We're getting sort of toward the end. I wanted to include some pieces that were very provincial, Ming pieces and Wan Li, late Wan Li pieces as we head into the transitional period. And there are a few transitional pieces here as well. Uh, this is a, a, a brush washer or an ink stone. Uh, for the Wan Li. This is in the British Museum and uh, has the nice calligraphic uh, base on the bottom. And here we have American period Wan Li uh, 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 brush washer. It's a small one. This is about three inches long. Nicely done. In the notice that the uh, rain mark on these is sometimes done in s within squares. Now here's an unmarked large jar that we had 
Uh, it's Ming. It was about 16 or 17 inches tall. And notice how the neck of the upper part is curved a little bit. It's not a straight neck. These are curved. Okay. And here's another one around the same time. Slightly different color. Uh, with a lid. Okay. <coughs> You'll notice on Ming pieces the lids always don't fit very well because they were made actually in a different factory and sort of matched up later with pieces once they were done. It was a common practice. And uh, here you have a big jar with a, with a sw sort of inwardly sweeping foot. And then again, that neck with that curve in it. Very typical. And here you have a Wanli uh, fruit jar, melon jar, persimmon jar. Um, now notice on the bottom of this, the lappets are still there, but they're very sketchy. They're not very, uh, very detailed anymore. And here's a little scholar's stand. Um, glazed, very thick blue glaze on this. Notice how blue that is. Uh, and a uh, very sort of rusticated base. And there's a nice sort of late 16th, early 17th century, I think, uh, jarlet, about six, seven inches tall, with lotus flowers and rue heads at the top filled in. And again, that very simple lappet base. Here is a mid 16th century, maybe first half of the 16th century, large guan, large jar, uh, 18 or 20 inches, t 18 inches tall, very nicely detailed, with good painting on it. And here you have a Wanli incense stick holder with calligraphy on each each side at the top, running around it with these nicely decorated and washed in um, floral devices. And here you have an early 17th. It could be mid 17th century. This is a later little provincial jar with a brown washed rim. Very thick glaze, loaded with bubbles. Notice it on the bottom picture. And here you have a Wanli uh, jar with a Fu Lion. This type of jar was exported in large quantities to Europe during this time and, and afterwards for a while. So you can find these actually in the market, usually not terribly expensive. And they also did these. Okay, They had different motifs. They had Fu Lions. They did spotted deer were very popular. Uh, this is sort of, I love how f the f one on the right looks sort of fat, um, standing in the grasses. And here is a very typical, very provincial Ming blue and white bowl. Not terribly rare. Um, you can buy these, sometimes you can buy them in lots of three or four uh, at an auction for maybe 150 or $200 if you're lucky. All right, and here's another uh, a dish. Uh, it's provincial, but sort of well done. Um, a nice, nicely detailed and filled in. The artist uh, did his best. And here is a another one of these uh, 16th century uh, jars with carp on it on the outside and the flowers. This probably is Jai Jing period. Nicely done. Nice neat foot on the bottom of it. All right. There were lots of kilns running in China during the Ming Dynasty and the Qing Dynasty. There were thousands. Most of them were family affairs. They it took several months for them to build up enough of a load to put in the kiln. The kilns were huge, these dragon kilns that they fired things like this in. And they filled them. They packed them tight. And every few months they they did a firing. And uh, hopefully the 10 or 15,000 or 8,000 or 5,000 pieces in there came out okay. Here is a big, uh, this is a very big charger that we had. Uh, Notice how small the uh, King of uh, Diamonds is in that picture. I'll give you an idea how big that plate was. It's, it's a late 16th uh, or mid 16th century sort of Swato type jar. And here are a few s transitional period things. Uh, 1630s, 1640s, 50s in there. And particularly nice use of cobalt on this big jar. And here you have another one. This is a very typical uh, uh, shallow bowl from this time or food pot. I think this was a food, I think it has holes on the ends for wire handles. Um, these are normally not terribly big, maybe 10 inches across. And here's an alms bowl. And notice on the bottom left picture, you have the sort of wavy swirls running around the outside. Pretty typical of these. Um, very nicely done. Uh, and you see them on big transitional vases as well. And here is a mid-17th century and so forth, the uh, diaper patterned uh, inkstone. Uh, it's a very nice one with that... that uh, uh, wash, brown wash they put over it. All right, and that's that'll pretty much cover it for today. Uh, here are some pictures. I just threw these in at the end to share a little bit. These are Hong Kong photographs that were taken in the 1870s and 80s. Early, early photography for China. Wonderfully done. And uh, there's another coming of the, with the harbor coming up. 
And I want to thank you for very much for taking the time to uh, listen to this and take a look. And uh, if you're not getting it already, sign up for our weekly newsletter. It's uh, uh, free. You can get it on our website, bitamount.com. It goes out every Saturday night. I think you might find it uh, very helpful if you buy things on eBay. We feature in it each week items that we've found from sellers that we know and are, know are reputable. Um, nice, authentic things. And you can sign up for it. And uh, I hope you find it uh, very beneficial. And if you have any questions about something you own or you need an appraisal or thinking of selling something and want help with it or whatever, give us a call. We're, in, we're right here in Gloucester, Massachusetts. And uh, we have other videos that we've put up, and I hope you take the time to look at them. I think we've got quite a few at this point. And uh, have a great day, and uh, good luck out there trying to find things. Bye-bye.